and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from the Imago cult, current de currently developing a box set introduction to their game Arcterica, the one and only Anton Relict. How are you doing today, man? Greetings, everyone. Yeah, I'm doing pretty great. Thank you, Mildra. Yep. So, I suppose the best place to start would be the humble beginnings, as that's the tradition around here. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, I, I remember when I was in a school, like fifth grade. Uh, it's, it is, uh, it's not usual case, but I started from computer games. Uh, I remember playing those Warcraft 3 maps where you play as a single hero. And I thought, oh, that, that, that is awesome. But I don't have uh, like permission for my parents to play all day long. So I try to convert the rules <laughs> of, of Warcraft 3 maps uh, to pen and paper games, even before knowing what, what, it, what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, together with friends, we really played a lot of uh, tabletop role-playing games, even before we stumbled on the first rule books of uh, Dungeons & Dragons, first rule books of uh, Warhammer. And, uh, yeah, Warhammer role-play, it was the thing that took me into the hobby. Uh, I remember seeing the Death Watch, and I thought, oh, it's pretty awesome, but, but uh, I, I'm not sure that I want to play it. Then I saw Only War, it's about Imperial Guard, and I thought, yeah, it's awesome, cool, but but it's not my cup of tea. And then I saw Black Crusade, <laughs> where you play as Power Space Marines, and I said, okay, friends, we, we are playing this. And the, this was my first serious uh, game. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, I was playing... For the first year, it was literally every night. We were playing every night, every evening. Uh, it was not just like one session per week, it was one session per day. Mm -hmm. uh, it caused me a huge troubles in the university. Uh, I uh, lost my uh, uh, stipendi, so I, I get uh, no wage from university. Uh, but but it was worth it. It was totally worth it. And uh, so we played all the additions uh, to Warhammer, played through the whole range, played uh, some D&D, but did not like it a lot, played uh, a lot of Pathfinder, World of Darkness, and other other games. Mm -hmm. So you had hopped around between between systems quite a bit. Uh, yes, but uh, I don't like to pop a uh, lot. Uh, I like to take one big system, the bigger the better, and uh, to play games where we can like dive for years in this game. Uh, so why why we were so uh, thrilled with Warhammer? Because like there were, uh, f if I'm not mistaken, like 40 gigabytes of PDFs. For Warhammer roleplay, and uh, we really enjoyed that. Even on playing like uh, for a year, we could find new content, find new stuff, implement it into our games, try something new. Like okay, we have played uh, a lot of battles, but let us try space battles now. Let us try new classes, new approaches. Uh, it was awesome time and. Uh, and we usually, uh, in our small group, we usually look look for big games mm -hmm. that could satisfy us with a lot of content. Which I can de I can definitely understand that. Now, that brings that brings me to the origin story of um, Arcter of Arcterica, which yes, Arcterica. you are 
descri you're describing as a shadow play take taking place in the um in the 19th cent in the 19th century um yes so what where did the idea to do this sort of secret society kind of game in that in that era in the in a very napoleonic era um come to be uh, so I was fond of Napoleonic era for a long time. Um, I read a lot of books about Napoleon, about the history of the period. Uh, I loved very I loved uh, their game uh, from Ukrainian studio, the Cossacks. It was a strategy, real time strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this era it is not uh, represented a lot. In the modern culture, like it's usually a medieval or Victorian era, and uh, there is a huge difference between Victorian era and the Napoleonic era. Mm -hmm. And um, we, our group, we wanted to do something new, something interesting. Uh, we well, we wanted to make a game uh, in set in the Napoleonic era. Uh, and about secret societies, uh, <laughs> I think it is because it was one of those periods when I discovered the X Files, mm -hmm. and I watched through all the seasons in a one uh, go, like in a few months, one or two months, I, I guess, and uh, was really eager to experiment in the, this way with uh, these ideas. So when uh, we aimed for this blend, like alternative early 19th century, the Napoleonic era, the gentlemen in top hats with flintlock muskets, pistols, and uh, they are united in a secret societies pursuing enlightenment, pursuing uh, unearthly secrets, and trying to fulfill their grotesque ambitions. So mm -hmm. this is the spirit of our Katerka. And in the quick start, which is currently available on Drive Through RPG, you list out the si the six features, which I guess would be would be fair to say that those are the six pillars of the world of Arcterica that you're de that you're setting up. Yes. Uh, I I can I can certainly get that. Now, there's a concept in a lot of game design discussion called Appendix N, which is a nod to the Appendix N section in early D&D that had a bunch of relate, related me, related non-gaming media that could be seen as seen as a inspirational reference. Um what would be a few examples of that? And this could this could be any anywhere from from television to film to video games to plays. I've seen I've seen people inspired by plays before. Oh. Mm -hmm. What would be a few examples for you, for you when it comes to something that someone could look at and get a feel for what your game is get what what sort of style your game is going for? Uh, yes, uh, in our quick start, we also have for this section, and uh, it was very hard to narrow down because uh, Arcterica it's uh, in its full rules in its full book. It is really a very deep uh, game with a lot of themes uh, where you can play it like historical game or you can play it like a very mind the fuck occult game. And uh, but if we have to narrow it down, uh, I can name like three TV shows. Uh, it's uh, the Black Sails. Mm -hmm. um, this it's a show about the Pirate Republic, and uh, I think it is great because it shows like it shows boats and adventures, and it shows the pursuing of personal ambitions. Uh, like you have the power to change the world, you have a power to establish a new country. You try to do that. Uh, you try to manipulate everybody around you. Build uh, very like uh, unreliable alliances, uh, con doing conspiracies, but you will try to move forward. And also, <laughs> there are things like pistols, and this is cool. So, first is black sails. Then, uh, if we go to a little bit darker side, it is uh, show uh, taboo. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, with, uh, yes, with Tom Hardy. And um, it's about uh, conspiracy, it's about the uh, 19th century. Um, and it is great in this uh, like shadow play mindset when you cannot trust anybody, when everybody, everything is not what it seems. And the third show is uh, um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. It's a, it's a show about uh, classical British uh, magicians, like a man trying to revive for classical uh, magic, English magic, British magic. And uh, it, it is also set in the 19th century, and this shows like uh, their more weird side of Arcaterica with, uh, with uh, spirits, with uh, visions, with uh, occult. Uh, with a uh, search for enlightenment where you can become something more than a mere mortal. So, this is three shows that I could recommend. And also, <laughs> if we are talking about this, I should add to the list the turn. It's uh, the show about American uh, war for independence, about uh, spies of Washington. Really great. Uh, it's about conspiracy, about spies. And uh, uh, the Emperor of Parish. Uh, we took the Emperor of Parish, also about conspiracy, 19th century, Napoleonic era. Uh, great movies. Uh, I uh, advise to take a look at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, shifting to the co the core mechanics that you that you have. If I re if I recall correctly, you're doing a two d six um system as far as your core resolution. Yes. Oh. Uh, so we use uh, two sided uh, two uh, six sided dices mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it feels like a classical approach. Like you can, uh, I bet you saw some movies or cartoons where main uh, heroes they throw two six sided dices and uh, hope for best results, hope for their luck. And uh, we wanted to go with that feel, and also it is very easy to find two six-sided dice, uh, especially if you are playing uh, war games like Warhammer, <laughs> and you have a lot of those dice. And uh, yes, and uh, we play a lot with dice, so with this combination, uh, why 2d6 is good. Mm -hmm. Let's a little bit nerdy stuff, but uh, 2d6 gives you the uh, correct range of uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the higher chance to roll the middle result, the 7. It's like, uh, will be every 6 roll will be 7. Uh, but if you try to roll the extremes, like Double one or double six, it will be only one in thirty-six rolls. Mm -hmm. So it it uh, it makes your rolls more stable. Uh, they are usually uh, closer to seven, and uh, we have this mecha mechanic called the flip upward, uh, where you can, uh, if you had a bad roll, for example, double one, uh, you can use some special abilities, and you literally take your dice and turn them the opposite side. And on uh, two six uh, on uh, six sided dice, uh, like the opposite of double one is double six. But if you have, for example, seven, the opposite of seven is always seven. Mm -hmm. And with the, now with that in mind, are you? I'm assuming, given what you mentioned about flips, that this is a aim high kind of two d six system instead of an aim yes. low. Yeah. Yes, and uh, we have special approach, uh, so uh, Akaterika in its narrative part, it is very flexible. Uh, I have to tell a few things about uh, character building, because I, I think and our community agrees that uh, the character building is one of the best parts of Akaterika. Uh, so in Akaterika, you build your character by uh, making up narrative attributes and narrative talents for your character. Uh, you can choose them from the list, uh, but it is more like list of inspiration. Hmm. 
and the narrative attributes they define like uh, the uh, wide strokes of your character like his gentleman his doctor his soldier and uh, they work as container for narrative talents and narrative talents it's like skills are um, first aid dancing uh, good handshakes everything you want to put into it has to be uh, thematical to your narrative uh, attribute and uh, when you do roles, when you want to make a role, uh, to, like to accomplish some task, uh, we don't have like uh, flat numbers. So you roll to d six, you add plus two. Or uh, you tell to the game master which talents we have, uh, uh, which uh, can be applied to, to this situation. Uh, for example, you are trying to lie somebody that you are ill, and uh, you say to game master, "Okay, my character, he has uh, his gentleman. He has talents of uh, high charisma, and also he is a doctor. He has a medical knowledge, uh, and uh, he has separate talent for uh, knowing like different illnesses." And uh, the game master then decides the difficulty of the role. Uh, depending on the situation, on the context, and on the talents the character have, and he says, "Okay, it will be like easy, five plus, roll five or higher to pass this test." And uh, this way, you can account not for one talent; you can account for different talents for their ranks, and uh, like characters, old enough characters that have played like for ten sessions, gaming sessions for. 20 gaming sessions, they can have up to 9 attributes, each having up to 9 talents, being very, like, uh, uh, many-sided character with different features, different skills, uh, very interesting characters to explore. And the narrative part goes very smoothly, it goes very quick, uh, and uh, our veteran players, they usually <laughs> compete to take the most niche talents possible and uh, to use them in the most eff uh, effective way, like, for example, having talent for handshakes uh, at your character. Mm -hmm. And given the narrative aspects, uh, I think that's an, that, is an import, that is an important um, thing to point out since... There's an issue of guidance that can happen with a lot of games that have a narrative leaning, where that where there's some sort of descriptive tag or or what have you that mm -hmm. is there is that there isn't given guidance as far as what would be good or bad or bad examples of it when you're giving the players and GM essentially a blank check, um, and. If I if I had to use an example of of what happens when when you don't have proper guidance, I'd refer to the aspect system in um, Fate. But mm -hmm. with with the with the narrative traits that you ha that you guys have, especially when it comes to narrative abilities, do you ha do you have a bit of guidance, whether it be through examples, whether it be through going into what what is a good example what is a bad example and so on uh so we have uh, such a uh, chapter in our full rules uh i have to like tell a bit a little bit about story that uh, uh cleric is in a, in development for some long time for i think more than a decade at, the, at this point and uh, we have a huge Ukrainian community playing a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, full rules in Ukrainian. There are about uh, 500 pages. Most of those pages, those are additional content, additional rules. I think we will talk about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is a deep dive. Uh, there's a chapter, separate chapter, chapter with a deep dive into these narrative roles with uh, guidelines. But from my experience, uh, I have heard a lot of concerns from different players saying that, oh, it might be very unfair system, it might be very, like, going wrong. But from my experience, uh, usually people get this system, like, 
from the first role. Uh, there is usually little to no discussions, debates, whether something is right or not. It, it is really flowing really quick, quickly. Uh, I also used to play the system in the, uh, our Comic Cons, Kiev Comic Con, uh, with a total uh, newbies uh, who are fresh to the hobby they have never played before. And uh, in two hours, we created character for each of them and uh, played the game and uh, played the whole adventure and uh, it's it's really goes smooth and uh we also had one experiment in our community so uh, as i understand that the difficulty of the test role is determined by the game master mm -hmm. uh by his judgment of uh, situation and context and we made the poll in our community asking uh, our community members to judge the difficulty of uh, like a typical 19th century gentleman with no special challenge for athletics or anything like that just just, just a typical male person uh, trying to climb a three meter high fence mm -hmm. and uh, surprisingly enough there was pretty consistent uh, answer. Yes, there were some extremes. Somebody said that it will be three plus uh, element or like three uh, trivial test. Somebody said it will be uh, 12 uh, plus uh, desperate test. But um, like 80% of members said that it will be a hard eight plus test. And uh, usually it does not, it, it works pretty well and uh, people get these rules uh, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the combat rules, you've, you've, cho you've taken a unique, a unique approach. Um, I'd say one, one of the first things to, n to note is having a action point system that also acts as initiative um, in a roundabout way, kind of reminding me of the shot system in Feng Shui. Um, what prompted taking that taking that approach of doing a two d six roll to determine action points, and then using that to, spending those action points on well actions to determine initiative? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, our play players group, we were a little bit traumatized by Warhammer combat. <laughs> uh, we, I, I still remember the day when we had an epic duel of uh, two corn champions, and uh, the only thing they were doing, they were just uh, like swift attacking each other, uh, turn by turn, and firing each other attacks. And uh, it went on endlessly uh, until some of one of them like lost a few rolls and uh, he was killed. But there was there was no uh, no tactical moves to do. You you just stood at, at one place and swift attacked each other. So we and we experimented. We wanted to do something uh, with the dy more dynamic with changing situation. And uh, that's why we use this uh, system where you roll your action points. And uh, at the start of the turn, you roll to d6. This is your action points. Uh, it also, to who has the most of action points, uh, this is the one doing actions right now. Mm -hmm. And you spend, you do something, you spend your action points, and uh, maybe you will also you will still be uh, the one with the highest points and doing the action or maybe it will be somebody else and uh, in Acterica you can spend your action points on uh, fencing we have six uh, in the full rules we have six uh, styles fencing styles fencing techniques each has uh, six moves uh, counting from like attacking moves uh, reactions and the stances mm -hmm. uh, and uh, usually character knows uh, two different uh, fancy techniques and uh, when you are fencing you have uh, a selection of 12 different moves mm -hmm. uh, like attacking counter-attacking blocking 
um, everything you can imagine. And uh, add this to the situation that each round you have a different situation, you have different uh, action points available, your companions have different action points, your enemies have different action points, and each round is uh, uh, some unique situation where you have to improvise to use your abilities uh, correctly. And uh, also add uh, to this one shot, uh, one shot black powder pistols, muskets, firearms, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, gives uh, they they blend really nicely in this fencing world because they are one shot uh, and they are well, very powerful. But you have to be very right with your timing uh, to get through to do this shot which will uh, like change the tide of uh, combat mm -hmm. and um, that's we like our players they give feedback that this system is it's really very easy to start uh, but it is very uh, like easy to start hard to master uh, in the full rules we have more than uh, about 200 combat talents mm -hmm. uh, where you can build your character you can build it in more uh, fencing style, more shooting style, dual wielding, to hand wielding. Uh, we have a great arsenal of uh, pretty accurate, historically accurate weapons. Uh, we um, it's separate topic for discussion, but we made a lot of uh, researches. Uh, we read the historical sources, spoke with historians. Uh, it was a fun uh, thing to do to do the, all these researches, mm -hmm. and uh, in the, if you remember, therapy is classless game, so you are you are not uh, limited. Like if you are a shooter, then you are a shooter. No, you, you can you can deep into shooting as uh, deep as you want. And you, for example, myself, I myself, I prefer the characters that are balanced uh, in the shooting, in the fencing, have some. Um, wide range of different talents for different situations yeah now and of, of of course i do i do most definitely see some of the um, warhammer influences when i look at that um, <laughs> combat matrix that you had that you had um put up um it's very it is very much reminiscent of the and even, even the mastery comparison that's in the um Quick, that's in the quick start has that particular vibe of this is what you need to be rolling when comparing your attack versus their defense and vice versa um yes so... it was taken from a uh, war game warhammer not not even from role play but from a war game from... uh, but yeah, but by the way, they return to this idea in Imperium Maledictum, and uh, I love Imperium Maledictum. Uh, I'm one of the playtesters of Imperium Maledictum. You, you can even <laughs> find me in uh, in this book, uh, which is a great great honor for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, we we took this system when uh, uh, if you are uh, we took it from war game like I think it was the fifth edition of war game. Then they dropped it. Uh, but when you are fighting against you are fighting in a close combat, now uh, the difficulty to hit this person depends on the uh, comparison of your skill and the skill of the one you are trying to hit, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this gives a uh, very um, interesting situation when uh, uh, for a fighter it is very important, for a good fencer it is important to get quicker into a close combat because he is more protected than when he can control his enemies. And uh, we have a separate mechanic for armor, so you can be armored fencer, you can be an armored fencer. Uh, but if you're a good fencer, then you are more 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 protected in uh, close combat. Uh, and this is also the why we went for this approach because our community in our our tabletop role playing club, uh, Playcard, even had its own fencing uh, community. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of our players like they spent a few hours fencing in the backyard. <laughs> and then they went to play some Arcaterica, mm -hmm. and uh, that made a lot of uh, sense for them because uh, experienced experienced fencer can easily protect himself 
from a group of like two, three people who are not experienced. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly no stranger to f to fencing, even if some grips I find more um, we more weird than others, like say Italian grips. Mm -hmm. Then again, I. Th then again, some, then again, some grips are clearly me are clearly meant for shorter people, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not, and I am not. I'm just shy of two. I'm just shy of two meters. Yeah, the same for me. So, so some, so some of the, so those one, those ones that have like that have like ring gimmicks, um, miss me with that. <laughs> <laughs> I I like to keep things simple. But I think what, one of the other things I find interesting is in character development, you have that same narrative combat divide between developing the narrative end of things um, and developing the combat end of things with different forms of experience, as opposed to a lot of approaches that try and have a unified ex experience approach. What prompted that? Yes, uh, so um, I I don't uh, remember it uh, for sure. Uh, maybe we were inspired by World of Darkness. Uh, I think that was the place where you get uh, experience points uh, in, uh, into the thing that you use, or, or I am mistaken. I think I am mistaken, yes? World of Darkness had, and, st and still has, a unified sp um, spend from XP ki kind of approach. Whereas you have um, yeah. you, have <laughs> you have experience po you have experience points for narrative, for combat, and for bur and for burden. Um, yes. And as far as so learning fr as far as learning from what you from the skills that you use the main one that comes to mind with that is some, is some of the games in the RuneQuest family. Uh, unfortunately, I have not played played the uh, RuneQuest. You've uh, RuneQuest yeah. is in the same is in the same family as um, basic role playing, which is the system yeah. that Call of Cthulhu uses and a and a handful of other games use. I yeah, do, yeah. I do remember. I I do know that entries like say Mithras have that very learn have that very um role to see if you advance um kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, about the separate uh, experience, uh, it is not even separate. So you get experience in the thing that you do. Um, you had a session where you fought a lot. You get uh, a lot of combat experience. Uh, you had a session where you like role played your burdens. Uh, burdens is like the weak points of your characters, but it's not necessarily the weak points. It's something that burdens you. For example, ideology, for example, some promises, family. Current ideology is not a bad uh, thing, but uh, it is it is a burden to follow it. And uh, you get a uh, separate experience for role-playing in such uh, things. And uh, narrative uh, experience, you don't uh, get like separate combat and narrative experience. You're going to get separate narrative experience in different narrative attributes that you use. Remember I told you that you have narrative attributes that like uh, uh, general features of your character mm -hmm. and uh, they use, they work as containers for talents. And for example, if your character is a gentleman and thief and you had a session where you role played, you used a lot of talents from a gentleman, but you had no opportunity to do uh, some uh, sneaky stuff. So you get a lot of points into a gentleman and nothing into the thief attribution. And this way, uh, you don't have to uh, to choose uh, do I want to develop into combat way or I want to develop more social skills. You will develop the thing that uh, you use, uh, the thing where your adventure goes more. And um, in Archetype, there are campaigns where you can play like 10 sessions and have no combat at all, mm -hmm. and it still goes well. Uh, or there can be sessions where you have very 
tough uh, roles for narrative situation where a tough narrative situation then desperate combat then you all played your burdens and uh, your character has a lot of experience to spend a lot of ex a lot of uh, personal development and uh, as i said building the ca the characters um, it is like the main feature of work therapy you build interesting characters you develop them uh, they change a lot they acquire um, a lot of experience they acquire new narrative attributes new burdens uh, they can uh, get uh, traumas both uh, body traumas and mental traumas they can receive uh, mystical abilities mystical gifts and the mystical curses and uh, move to being something closer to otherworldly entity more otherworldly entity than a normal human mm -hmm. and uh, this is like the best thing in Archetherica, it is best played in uh, long campaigns. Uh, it is okay for one-shots. Uh, unfortunately, I've been playing one-shots like for a few years now, because <laughs> I had no uh, possibility for myself for, to play big campaigns. But in big campaigns, when you start as, uh, okay, I will play a young student uh, who is who has this uh, ambition to change the world, and uh, he is uh, doubling into uh, into occult stuff, and he's just a young man. And then in like thirty sessions, uh, you have this one-handed, uh, gray-haired man with absent gaze who knows a lot of things who have a lot of very niche skills and uh, uh, his his highway to becoming immortal being and a lot of drama going on <laughs> with his character his burdens uh, this is this is like the right way to play Archiderica. Uh, we had some campaigns that lasted for more than 100 sessions uh, a few of them and uh, yeah, those the, the most interesting stuff it is to see how characters changed along the way mm -hmm. now with with that in mind there's a part of me that's curious if arcterica could support a campaign that's more akin to a passion play the the way um ars magica is a passion play kind of design uh can you tell more more about passion play what what do you mean by it now, obvious, obviously, passion play means something in in actual plays, but for the context of this, it is the idea that the story is going to involve multiple participants, and thus the and thus um between scenes, it wouldn't be unreasonable for the uh, campaign to have the players having multiple characters that they play as, depending on the scene in question. I, I think it is possible, uh, especially if you are playing as high-ranking secret society. Uh, we we had uh, used such a system when we played a lot of uh, open tables. Uh, we had uh, some campaigns, open tables, but we used this system like, okay, your character is wounded, but uh, the story is going on, you can use uh, other character while your main character is uh, healing. So it's not the same as what you are saying, but I, th I think it is totally possible. Yeah. Now, that that being said, in your experience, did, did, um, most, did most tables have one particular conspiracy that all the player, all the characters were um, associated with, or did you have, char did you have characters and parties who were were affiliated with with multiple secret societies or conspiracies? Uh, yes, uh, usually Arcaterica, oh, uh, it is the world full of secret uh, organizations, and uh, usually we construct and venture in such way that characters uh, play our characters. Uh, they start uh, with a reason to unite in their own secret society. Um, in Arcoterica, you can build your own secret organization, you can develop it. Uh, but usually, uh, especially if we are playing with experienced players who want additional challenge, who know the lore, 
uh, even if you are members of uh, one and the same you know, secret society, you usually have a different patch patrons, different uh, goals, different factions which you try to achieve, uh, and uh, um, especially when when we were playing open tables. Uh, we had very strong PvP element because we had uh, different uh, like player groups representing different secret organizations, and we have rules uh, for uh, such activity. Like one organization can uh, vassalize uh, other organization, uh, become its so sovereign, and uh, you can build your own uh, empires, uh, shadow empires, in a such way, trying to conquer other organizations. And uh, we had uh, campaigns where one one group of players made their own secret organization, other group made their own, and then uh, they decided, uh, one group did, like convinced the other that it is best for them to become their vassals. And they worked together, but all that time, this uh, the Vassal organization conspired to overthrow their sovereign to get to get their resources, and uh, it was a very fun thing to do. Uh, yeah, but uh, as always, playing PvP, uh, you have to be very mature about it. Uh, I cannot say that we were. <laughs> We were very mature when we started playing PvP games. Uh, there were some hard lessons, broken friendships, <laughs> you, you, you can imagine. Uh, but uh, now our veteran players, they know how to play correctly into PvP. And uh, usually uh, the best adv advice here is uh, not to play, uh, not to aim for destruction of somebody. Uh, but uh, to aim for competing goals. Yeah. For, ex I've... for example, yeah, the, the, there is like a uh, uh, secret, other third secret society, and uh, one group want to conquer it, other wants to eliminate it, but uh, they will not go as far as eliminate each other because they, they, they still have some connections to each other and they don't want to have an open war. Which I'd I know that it'd be te I know that'd be tempting to do a whole lot of a whole lot of backstabbing with the, with a game all about conspiracy, but from my own perspective, I'd prop in because I've done my fair share of spy fiction games. I'd t I'd tell people don't do anything that would endanger the agenda that you're working with. If you're do if you're don't do um lol random kind of thi kind of things. Yeah. Or to or to put it another way, and I I wish I came up with this term, but I didn't. Um, don't be the don't be the nenad. Nenad is is an acronym for neutral evil ninja assassin drow, and <laughs> was kind was kind of used as was kind of used as a stand in for all the things you don't do as a player. <laughs> and and even more so, don't do it. And then say, "I'm just playing my character." In most yeah, well... most tables, will not like you for doing that. And you do. And at my table, if somebody did that, they'd have to drink a bot. They'd have to drink the pain glass, which is a shot glass full of, filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, and about five different really spicy hot sauces. <laughs> Oh, and when I say real spicy, I'm talk I'm talking the stuff that um, you the stuff that has a warning label on it. <laughs> uh, funny that you mentioned backstabbing because uh, there is a separate, as we call it, main social mechanic of Arcaterica. Uh It is called the Mortis Trick, mm -hmm. and uh, it is. Uh, the best way to explain it is like sneak attack, which is available for every character. Uh, you can do Mortis trick against anybody who is not aware that you are going to attack them. So it is commonly used uh, during negotiations or when you sneak onto somebody. And uh, this attack, it deals double da damage, which is usually enough to kill anybody. Yep. And 
and I think this mechanic it is very important for all uh, um, like like you said like uh, espionage games. Um, I I really home rule it into every game that I play. Uh, because uh, how can you play espionage when there is there is no way to uh, subtly kill someone in a one uh, well placed uh, strike mm. or shot? So and uh, this uh, mechanic uh, it defines architectural very much. Uh, not only because uh, players use it a lot, but because players know that it is there. <laughs> that they can be uh, more just trick could be used on them uh, they know that uh, they always can uh, uh, they try to start all confrontations from uh, negotiations because they know that uh, the best way to end negotiations it is more just trick when you try to kill somebody uh, with this so, so, uh, sneak attack essentially which, well, you've there. There's a run. There's a running joke that the Roman handshake is to shake with the left hand and stab with the right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this mechanic, it's really create a lot of very dramatic, very interesting uh, situations uh, with NPCs, with uh, inside the uh, inside the party. Uh, you, if you use it with non-lethal. Uh, weapons then it has big chance not to kill but uh, to like stun your target uh, to make it unconscious mm -hmm. so uh, there's uh, a lot of different utility a lot of uh, awesome uh, situations uh, I, I advise to take a look on our actual play of good mayor when uh, memochi's trick was used once through the whole uh, actual play, but it was it was great moment. It was a defining moment for characters. Mm -hmm. And ev even if it's only used once, um, it's it's a good it's a good example of the analogy: one sword keeps another in the sheath. Yes. Yes. You know, you it may only be you it may only be used once, but that one time is. In, is um, the fact that that one, that it can be used is enough of a deter is enough of a deterrent. Um, you know when everybody when everybody can potentially use it. No, no, it's a matter of who's actually going to go through with it. Um, yes. Now, with that with that said, the invitation box set that you're currently developing. Um, since that is containing the introductory rules and then th and three adventures, uh, how I am I am curious if if down the road after the Kickstarter is finished, if the um, introductory rules that you're pl that you're planning will be its own, will be its own digital purchase on say Drive Through RPG. Or... Uh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh... It will be available on uh, drive-through RPG as a digital version. Uh, it will be uh, a little bit expense more expensive than uh, than on Kickstarter uh, because on Kickstarter we put the like the lowest price uh, as a token of gratitude to our bakers and because this is the money we need to finish all the like final touch uh, for these uh, documents. Uh, about the box itself, uh, uh, the printed version, I think it will be pretty much exclusive for Kickstarter uh, for now. now. Maybe you could find it on uh, different conventions, mm -hmm. uh, but I I'm not sure that uh, it will be available in a printed version uh, on uh, any websites. Uh, unless we're talking about Ukrainian version. Uh, I was approached by a few our local clubs, uh, local uh, shops, and uh, I think we will uh, print a little bit more for for them to have on sale. Mm -hmm. That makes that makes sense. Now, 
with with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a gen a general estimate. Uh, so uh, these our introductory set. We I I it's almost uh, ready uh, in uh, design terms. Uh, I think we will able to deliver it uh, in autumn at fall. Um, maybe earlier, maybe later, but uh, from my side, uh, all the job uh, is done, and uh, it is only work for translators, uh, the editors, and uh, uh, the designers to put it all uh, together. And uh, I hope that this uh, the invitation, our starter set, it will work as like a a uh, first step into our Katerika. And uh, I, I uh, hope uh, very much that we will be able to release the full rules. Uh, the full rules for Katerika, it will be a big uh, rule book with uh, more than 600 pages. Uh, uh, we really understand that it is not uh, big rules, big uh, books that are not uh, popular today. Uh, that the, this approach has a lot of downsides, uh, but this is the way we want to do this project. And uh, I hope that maybe in a year, maybe in the two years, <laughs> maybe even later, but we will be some someday we will be able to announce the uh, Kickstarter for the full rules. Uh, which will include the rules for managing your own secret society, uh, rules for doing occult ritual practices, uh, developing your own uh, like occult practice, which helps you move around stars and send dreams to different people, uh, rules for uh, doing X-Files style uh, medical experiments on people and uh, other, other, other uh, such stuff. We even have separate rules uh, for reading occult literature uh, that can drive you insane or it can drive you enlightened mm -hmm. and they give you mystical abilities. Uh, everything is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, when you when you mentioned that idea of of risking madness to get um, to get supernatural abilities, what immediately came to mind was um, cult. Yeah, unfortunately, I had no uh, ability to play cult, but uh, I hope to fix that soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. but I, I have read through the book. It is, it is really a great, great theme, great art style. Uh, it's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Oh. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime thank you see to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks a lot, Mildred. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!